Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online.
Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to CSIS. My name is Seth Center. I'm the director of the Project on History and Strategy. It is a rainy day in Washington, D.C., but one of the benefits of Zoom and YouTube is that it is presumably sunny somewhere. Someone who's watching is, so please channel that to us in Washington. Uh, I'm delighted, really, to be here uh, with a great strategist, a teacher, a leader, and a teacher of leadership, Susan Eisenhower. Um, she's also incredibly optimistic and a terrific person that I've had the pleasure of getting to know. And we're here, obviously, to talk about uh, a really important book that she's written that's just come out, How Ike Led, The Principles Behind Eisenhower's Biggest Decisions. It is, it is really a wonderful book. Um, I might add, Susan is also an incredible historian. As I've been reading through this book, I've really admired the craftsmanship of, of the work. Uh, the, the beauty of this book is it's not just a book about aphorisms of, from Dwight Eisenhower, although there are some beautiful aphorisms on leadership in the book, and I picked out three that I thought were particularly great from, from Ike. Uh, anger cannot win. It cannot even think clearly, which is terrific. On pessimism, <laughs> any pessimism and discouragement I might ever feel would be reserved for my pillow. I think all of us should take that one on. And something that he told his granddaughter, Susan Eisenhower, you've got to be for something, which is terrific advice. This is not um, a nostalgic history at all in any way. Um, in fact, it shows just what a tough period Dwight Eisenhower led through. It was not just the geopolitical turmoil, uh, which was immense. It was really an incredibly divisive period in American political and cultural history. And what's most remarkable about it is that even in the midst of that turmoil, you could have principled leadership to deal with seemingly insoluble and intractable problems. The book is not also a, a strategy book in the sense of being about grand strategy or a national security strategy. It's about something much more important and enduring, which is the strategies for how someone, a leader, can move nations, move large organizations, and most importantly, move individuals um, in productive, optimistic, and ultimately better directions. So it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a book really with multiple audiences and benefit to any number of them. Um, our, our, our roadmap for today is very basic. Susan and I will have a conversation. And then we invite everyone who's listening to participate by um, asking questions through the question function on the CSIS event website. And we will do our best to incorporate those over the course of our discussion today. So please do ask questions. Susan, welcome. It's terrific to have you. Thank you for being here. Why don't you just start out by telling us a little bit about your project? Oh, well, thank you, Seth. Uh, first of all, what a pleasure it is to be at CSIS, even under these extraordinary circumstances. But it's a, it's a privilege and an honor to be with you because I know your own program uh, really studies uh, a lot of what is in my book. And you're absolutely right. It's not a strategy book. Uh, as a matter of fact, I've had a couple of reviewers say, what is this book? Is it a memoir? No. Is it a history? No. Is it a leadership book? No. Is it a strategy book? No. And I think the answer is, I hope, um, all of it. And I, I decided after years of uh, working in some of the leadership development programs, and I do some consulting and, and uh, offer those services uh, from time to time, uh, there's always an inclination for people who work in this area to um, provide a 10, uh, 10 step plan to becoming a great leader. And it's, uh, and first you have to do this. And second, you have to do this and this. And I thought, well, actually what we really need to do is to show leadership, uh, not uh, tell it. And that's what I tried to do in this book. Uh, I also tried hard not to insert myself too often, but occasionally I would hear things around the dining room table or my father, oh my gosh, my father, John Eisenhower, who was a military historian was a terrific um, source of just all this framing. I mean, one of my favorite aphorisms, if you will. Um, I asked my father once, what was the Eisenhower administration's most um, important conclusion about the Soviet Union? And my father had a very wry wit and 
uh, was a man of few words, said that the Soviet Union, uh, that the leadership in the Soviet Union are not um, early Christian martyrs. <laughs> so <clears throat> some, uh, you know, the uh, conclusion of the administration was they wanted to live um, and that therefore there might be some ways to um, find points of contact uh, that would work towards um, stabilizing the global situation. <laughs> I mean, th this, this is an exquisite leadership tale. And what's most remarkable about the way you tell it is it so quickly reaches the human level and makes clear that the essence of Ike's leadership was seeing enormous complex, even abstract problems, but being able to drill down to an individual or a human or a human aspect of it. I think you wrote, you solved human problems on a human basis. What, what do you mean by that? Well, what I love about it is that those are not my words. I actually got to use his words. I don't know how many people realize that after World War II, uh, Chief of Staff of the Army, Dwight D. Eisenhower, uh, notified the uh, superintendent of West Point, Max Taylor, that uh, it was time for a psychology department at West Point. And of course, this was like, probably raised a few eyebrows because West Point, even, even more so then, was known as really an engineering school. Uh, but Ike said that it was about time that the Army learned how to uh, define, um, human, uh, define problems um, in a human way, human problems in a human way. Um, so I would say in, in, in stepping back at this capacity to look at all of the, these, um, uh, the factors of any complicated situation as well as the, the ones out there that are on the way in, there were two things that were really striking. Uh, first, I mean, in my research, uh, because I didn't really know this kind of detail until I started the book, um, but first of all, he was um, very adept at um, thinking about human nature. Uh, I think he got that from his mother, who was really a humanist, and she would always say to him, well, young Ike, you know, how, how do you think it looks to the other guy? And boy, if I didn't have lessons about that all the time that were not uh, welcome and necessarily <laughs> desirable at any dinner table. My brother and I used to argue all the time and, you know, uh, granddad would say, stop, stop. How does it look to the other guy? We'd have to provide an analysis. So he had this capacity to put himself in somebody else's position to understand the context of their, of their position. And understanding the context helps a lot because then you can begin to address pieces of it. Um, there's an occasion uh, in 1959, in the middle of the Berlin ultimatum that uh, Nikita Khrushchev ends up in the United States for a 10-day tour and a negotiation with Eisenhower at Camp David. And Ike knew the Russians well enough to know that the, you know, probably the single most personal thing they're obsessed by are their children. Um, and so he arranged to have uh, uh, Khrushchev come to the Eisenhower farm and my siblings and I were trotted out to remind the um, Soviet premier of what was at stake here, our grandchildren. And it, it had a, a, quite a, an effect on Khrushchev, as a matter of fact. So that capacity to um, think about what motivates other people, um, what makes them feel comfortable, uh, where you can find touchstones is all important. Then the other thing, speaking of grandchildren, if you really look at his speeches, uh, a, a surprising number of them mention our grandchildren as a metaphor for the future. And I think if anything comes out of this book, I want people to understand that he was always playing the long game. If I may uh, use CSIS as a place to coin a new word I'd like to have into our strategy um, vocabulary, I would say he was always looking for a sustainable strategy. Uh, in other words, anything that had to be changed every two years or four years when there was a new president, that's not a strategy at all. He was looking for sustainable strategies that would enable us uh, to prepare for the moment, have your contingencies in place, and to move forward in an orderly way. Um, do you think that's because maybe he was a military man? You know, I don't. I actually, I actually don't. It seems exceptional. Um, 
you know, even, and I'm, I'm thinking he, he had a sense of his place in history and where history was going, which seems quite remarkable. And, and for me, the, the episode that best demonstrates that is when he experienced the death camps in 1945, and he experienced them with the foresight to realize uh, that these were um, both horrible, but also unique and could be powerfully political decades into the future. And I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about experience because it's just such a, an example of someone with, with strategic foresight. Well, I think that's right. And then the other rather stirring thing that goes with that series of stories, uh, I unearthed a, a quote that he, you know, has been uh, properly verified that is really extraordinary. After uh, the surrender, Ike looks up and looks at his staff and he says, uh, if Germany is a prosperous democracy 50 years from now, we will have succeeded. So now there are two instances in only a matter of weeks where he's thinking about 50 years out, uh, which I think is a little surprising. I mean, I would, I would offer a guess about it. I, uh, he was a, an avid reader of history. I mean, it was so bad his mother had to lock up his books literally because um, you know, he wasn't out doing his chores. All he wanted to do was read about history. Uh, he loved military history too, which was perfectly shocking for a pacifist family. <laughs> but um, I think he, you know, uh, noted the historical trends and actually uh, absorbed that and thought about um, history and history uh, as it would be written later. Not about himself. I think he was, uh, I mean, I know for a fact he was extraordinarily modest and never wanted that kind of attention. But in terms of the larger trends, uh, it, it fascinated him and he made it his own. You title an entire chapter, Personal Accountability Without Caveats. It's impossible not to talk about <laughs> that chapter. Yeah. Let's, let's, st let's stick with the history for, for a minute. What, how does I think about accountability and what are the, what are the great examples? Um, well, I think the most iconic example of this is what uh, I call the unused communique. And it's interesting that uh, this communique was um, stashed in Ike's wallet during uh, the assault on the um, French coast in Normandy. Um, and he, in, in the note, he was going, obviously was going to release it to the press uh, should everything um, fail to deliver the results that he'd planned for. But it said, you know, that um, our, our troops have failed to um, uh, make a beachhead on the Normandy coast and um, the uh, Army, Navy and Air Force did all of devotion to duty, you know, could do. Uh, he says, if there's any um, blame that is to be attached to this, it's mine alone. Um, so Harry Butcher, his naval aide, finds, um, well, comes in. He was the uh, headquarters diarist. And like, do you have any papers for our files today? And um, I said, well, I don't think so. But I don't know how the subject actually came up. I've read Butcher's account of this. Anyway, Butcher wanted the piece of paper. And I said, no, no, no. Um, the communique wasn't used. And um, I'd rather keep it myself. And Butcher got very insistent, so I gave it to him. And then Eisenhower says, as Butcher's leaving the room, you know, I carried one of those for every invasion. Um, and that would have been, um, you know, invasions before of North Africa um, and Italy. And those invasions were still, in and of themselves, the largest that had been conducted up until that time. So, um, uh, he was, he, um, and if, Seth, if I could say one more thing about this, which is um, I, I was worried that civilians wouldn't understand this part of his mentality. But when you um, pledge your oath to the Constitution at West Point, which you do, not to the president, but to the Constitution, um, West Point and other places are really asking you to sacrifice yourself your country. You might be killed in action, but um, Ike had this sense of sa self-sacrifice really embedded in his DNA. And I think a lot of that comes too from the religious environment he grew up in. 
Um, so during the war, and you see it during his presidency too, there's sort of a little bit of a flavor of fatalism. Well, I'm going to do what I think is, is right here. And if I don't get elected again, uh, the press is saying to him, what do you think the impact of that decision was? And he say, I, I have no idea. I haven't even thought of it. And, and I think he was being absolutely sincere. The same uh, during World War II, when he gets sent to uh, take up command in Europe, all of his friends told him that he was you know, being sent to be fired um, because things were looking so grim. And he said, well, you know, somebody's gotta be fired. So this kind of fatalism is a really interesting dimension of this man, I think. I think at one point you, ter you termed it optimistic fatalism, which is a, yeah. <laughs> a, very, a very interesting dialectic right, between someone who, who believes so much in optimism or at least projecting optimism and yet had a, a sense of, of uh, melancholy. But I, but I think the, the fatalism comes from his own future because he says to uh, one of his uh, World War II comrades, he says, a man just has to forget his fortunes, his personal fortunes. Um, and so actually it's a very optimistic way of thinking about it that somebody's going to be making the tough calls and it's going to be um, in a cause that's greater than him. And that cause is going to be successful. And he truly believed that if um, he was pessimistic as he visited the troops, he said, who wants to go into combat with some, when, when the big guy doesn't even think it's going to succeed. He thought optimism was a critical part um, of his job without being um, irresponsible. It's, it's striking, um, e even after the U2 episode, where it really threw his entire foreign policy into a real, really challenging moment. And he had an opportunity to hang a few people out to dry for some poor advice he got. He refused to do it, even at that point, which is really quite remarkable, because he had good cause and he still refused to pass the buck. Well, he had good cause, and some people call it plausible deniability, but the, um, the, the idea behind plausible deniability is that the big guy gets away with it and somebody takes the fall. And um, Milton Eisenhower, Ike's uh, youngest brother, uh, was very clear on this point. Uh, he said that uh, Ike would never, he'd have to fire somebody um, if he adopted that approach and that it would be um, a moral injustice to the person he fired when it wasn't the person's fault. Ike at the end um, believed in the Truman idea of the buck stops here, um, but uh, he just simply would not um, hold his subordinates responsible, even if they advised it, because he made the ultimate decision. And uh, that's, that's a sort of a novel kind of refreshing idea these days, I think. It's, 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 it's really striking in a, in a series of episodes in, in his life. Um, the middle way also has a prominent place in this story, not just as a political place, but as a, as a philosophical disposition, I think, to, to explain how he approached problems, how he approached inter human interaction. Can you, can you talk a little bit about what you meant when you described, or what, what he meant when he talked about the middle way as a, as a guiding principle? Well, um, as an introduction, uh, I'll try and make this brief, but as an introduction to the middle way, I have to say that Ike was absolutely a constitutionalist. Um, he was very, very aware of two things. First of all, the three co-equal branches of government, but more importantly for his branch of the government, um, the contradictions that the Constitution of the United States places on the President of the United States. The President is supposed to be uh, head of state, uh, head of the executive branch, and head of his political party. Um, and this um, set of contradictory ideas uh, can put the President in a very awkward position uh, because he might feel inclined to be the head of his party, but that might be counterproductive for the other two roles he plays. Um, and so uh, as he, I think temperamentally, Ike was uh, a middle way kind of guy, but the middle way is also embedded in his ideas about constitutionalism, that uh, the executive branch represents um, one third um, of our system, uh, my, mind you, a powerful third, no, no question, um, but 
the middle way is a way to bring other branches, specifically Congress, of course, into a central um, in a central area, you know, called the middle way. I mean, you've got the extremes on both sides. Um, but the middle way is where you compose your differences, where you have uh, frank but respectful discussions. Um, and then, you know, it is, it is a, you might say a highway where, um, uh, you know, progress can be made for the country from all sides. And, and this sounds utterly naive in today's environment, but let's remember for six years of Eisenhower's presidency, um, the opposite party controlled both the House and the Senate, and he still got 80% of his legislation uh, through Congress, which was rather amazing. Um, of course, I remember um, the never be forgotten um, um, Alan Simpson, uh, Senator from Wyoming, who told me once um, that the only thing in the middle of the road are dead raccoons and squirrels. And so I said, to, <laughs> Simpson, well, I guess that makes me political road killer or something. I still believe in the middle way, but uh, uh, Eisenhower did too, and that might have been part of his optimism. But it, it, during that time, I think it was largely successful. He certainly got a tremendous amount of heat from, from his own party. <laughs> I mean, it was quite remarkable to see, to see what kind of pressure he was under um, to deviate. It wasn't as if all Americans embraced the middle way in the 1950s. That's, that's for sure. Well, uh, on the contrary. Now, remember that his approval rating rested around 66 to 68 percent, which is extremely high, as you know. But remember who his base of support is. These are people who served under him during World War II, uh, felt like they had an intimate relationship uh, with the president. But no, the um, you see the the and it's very interesting for me because today, again, uh, the Republican Party is at a turning point, I believe, they're, they're, or a crossroads, whatever you want to call it. Um, but in 1952, it was at an enormous uh, crossroads as well because uh, Truman's approval ratings uh, were in the tank. Uh, uh, the United States was engaged in another war. It was called the Korean War. And, and it was... Uh, you know, it wasn't a very happy place, America. A lot of labor disputes and this and that. And there was some chance that the Republicans uh, might come to power, but the people who dominated the Republican Party at that stage after being out of power for 20 years were the isolationists. Uh, so I think actually one of his biggest accomplishments that people don't talk about too much um, was him beating back <laughs> members of his own party and creating a consensus within the Republican Party and therefore um, a consensus among Republicans and Democrats for uh, an international profile for the United States to uh, assume that leadership that became um, such a hallmark of our power. Do you think his approach changed when he shifted from General Eisenhower to President Eisenhower? It, stri it strikes me that some principles of leadership are enduring on the other hand, different dimensions of responsibility force one to um, value different principles. Uh, it, it strikes me, you know, there's a really great quote from him um, where he said, in Washington, the job has not even started when self-conviction has been achieved, right? This is, whereas in the, as a commanding officer, self-conviction is the essence of, of uh, leadership. Um, it's quite a remark. He, he seemed to see a quite a big shift. Oh, he, well, he did see a big difference. And, and it's, it's fair to say that as Supreme Allied Commander, he knew politics, all right, but they were military politics. And they were politics around um, strategy, because as you know, the United States and Great Britain um, compromised a lot on um, the various phases of the war. Um, but uh, military politics uh, appears in his mind to be really quite different. I, I love that quote myself. And then he, he rattles, he says as Supreme Commander, the biggest job is, is to be convinced of the plan you're going to pursue, okay? He says, as, as you quoted, that's only the beginning in politics. And then he goes into this whole long list of all the strange characters and what their motives might be. And I think um, he really came a cropper, as the British would say, uh, during one of his first campaign outings, uh, when he ends up um, rather miserably in Wisconsin, um, where um, Senator Joseph McCarthy 
uh, is on the podium while he's trying to uh, make a speech. And uh, I think probably everybody on this call knows that story, but I could not approve that speech, uh, the speech that got leaked to the press. Um, and he decided to take the advice of his uh, political, um, <clears throat> his uh, political advisor um, that um, uh, an incongruous paragraph about George Marshall um, should be uh, added into that because McCarthy was, you know, um, accusing uh, George Marshall of all kinds of things. Well, truthfully, I could already given four or five speeches where he talked about McCarthy's, um, I'm sorry, uh, George Marshall's, uh, one of the greatest patriots. He had nothing but um, enormously um, positive things to um, say about George Marshall. Um, what he didn't calculate, because he was a military man, not a politician, was that A, the staff would leak the draft before it was approved. Um, and secondly, that the news media uh, would completely ignore the five other times he said that George Marshall was the greatest patriot this country has seen. Um, and he was so shocked by that, I believe. I mean, this had reverberations even for my generation, I can tell you. Um, and um, he was so shocked by this. But the interesting thing about Dwight Eisenhower is he usually only makes the same mistake. Uh, he only makes it once. And he learned after that, okay, I'm not in the army now. I don't have staff who could be fired for such a thing necessarily. Um, there is no discipline um, around uh, uh, the mission and the Supreme Commander's orders, et cetera, et cetera. And he learned very quickly that, um, you know, that this was gonna be a different deal. The McCarthy episode is instructive. Uh, you title it a strategist takes on a demagogue. So the assessment that there is a strategy behind Eisenhower's madness. I think a lot of people at the time saw him as having a lack of courage to take on McCarthy. Explain why you think there was a strategy. Oh, well, there's a strategy, of course, because I, as I mentioned earlier, um, Eisenhower is a constitutionalist. He knows as president of the United States, he has no authority and no capacity to censure the behavior of a senator who is a member of a co-equal branch of government. So standing up and talking about McCarthy all the time uh, might feel really good, might make you feel better, might make you feel like you're doing something, but actually there's no, um, uh, there's no end result that comes from that. Especially if you find out, uh, and this is the, the critical point of this, is that Joseph McCarthy was a very popular figure. And as a matter of fact, the president's own party supported Joseph McCarthy. So he had to find a different way to um, eliminate McCarthy's power because he couldn't stand the guy. So first of all, <laughs> the strategy, uh, the, the long-term goal, of course, is to make sure um, that ultimately the Republicans um, censure, uh, sorry, yeah, they were in charge, they were uh, in, in power in both houses at that time, that they would, uh, that the Senate would censure Joseph McCarthy. Okay, that was the end goal. Um, but in the meantime, he wasn't about to let Senator McCarthy have anything he wanted. And uh, this is a military man thinking, what do you do when you have an opponent or an enemy? You don't give them what they want. And he assessed that what Joseph McCarthy wanted was the president's attention and wanted to be elevated to that debate uh, to make um, Senator McCarthy, who probably had presidential ambitions. Ike was not about to give him the creds uh, to uh, go on to higher office. So for a year and a half, Dwight Eisenhower never mentioned the Senator's name. <laughs> this drove McCarthy nuts. And it gets worse and worse and worse over the course of this year and a half till he finally takes on the United States Army thinking that he's gonna get a rise out of the president. Um, and behind the scenes, Eisenhower is working very hard, you know, with uh, the senior leadership in the Republican party to, um, uh, to censure this man. It only finally became clear that that was the only option after Ike, according to David Nichols in his great book, Ike and McCarthy, um, made sure that the Army McCarthy hearings were televised and McCarthy just withered under the lights. 
Um, but, you know, um, when we talk about the bully pulpit, it's really not fair um, in the sense that people who want leaders to use the bully pulpit only want the people who agree with them to have the bully pulpit. What happens when the person you don't like gets the bully pulpit? I mean, you could say in a way that uh, McCarthy had that. So I was going to deprive him of it. But Eisenhower used the presidential bully pulpit to talk about principles and the principles um, that represent America. And there's some very stirring quotes in that chapter. Uh, you know, you're not going to fight communism by destroying America. Okay. And um, <laughs> Um, only Americans can hurt Americans um, and, and the kinds of things. And then there are many other things don't join the book burners and, and uh, that great uh, speech at Dartmouth. So, yeah, it's a different kind of strategy. But of course, you know, even today, we're still talking about uh, not as, um, using the bully pulpit. But I, I can only say it works when it works and it doesn't when it doesn't. Did he pay a, a personal toll either in his relationships or, or psychologically for, for this approach, which really required an enormous amount of self-restraint? Oh, he was getting help from everybody. He was, he was even getting help from his uh, administ, uh, administ, uh, insiders in his administration. Um, even uh, this younger brother, Milton, who was uh, extraordinarily close to Ike personally, was telling me I ought to speak out against McCarthy. And I'm telling you, he just wouldn't budge. He says, this is what McCarthy wants, wants. And, and I'm not gonna get down in the gutter with that guy. Um, uh, I'm not gonna uh, stoop to that level. I'm not gonna give him what he wants. And it sure, it took a year and a half and, and it's terribly regrettable that some people suffered in the meantime, um, but many more would have been uh, suffered if he had been empowered for some of the crazy views he advanced. I hate to be presentist in a wonderful history, but the, the, the chapter that resonated most with me was the experience with Sputnik. Ah. <laughs> Sputnik, of course, now is in some ways seen as um, this moment we would like to recreate to galvanize ourselves uh, to approach the technological or strategic challenge posed by China. And so people have evoked, we need another Sputnik moment. Or why haven't we had a Sputnik moment? Or this should have been a Sputnik moment. <laughs> but when you actually uh, experience Sputnik from Eisenhower's perspective, actually, this entire story is wrong. Uh, well, I, I, I must say, I've heard that um, I, I sit on a committee. I won't uh, bore you with the details, but um, somebody put out a first draft of some paper that's going to be released and says, uh, we're, we're, we're now at a Sputnik moment. I wrote back and I said, eh, you know, really not so much. <laughs> uh, the, the reason for it is, is that uh, not only did the administration know that um, Sputnik was going to be launched, uh, we were planning on launching our own artificial satellite, but we had agreed with the Soviet Union to launch, uh, both countries to launch satellites. And th this is because the, um, uh, it was part of um, something that uh, the scientific union International Scientific Union uh, dubbed International uh, Geophysical Year. It was an attempt to go out and explore um, the, you know, space and um, all of the undeveloped uh, parts of the world and the oceans. And uh, it was quite a comprehensive plan. Anyway, uh, just to uh, say this briefly, uh, the administration knew it was coming. Um, it was in the New York Times frequently. They were actually having bilateral meetings about um, uh, the progress uh, both sides were making on their um, satellite projects. So I'm sure both sides are being very cagey not to offer too much information, but there was nothing secret about this. And, um, and actually for the first three weeks or so, the public was wow and a little perplexed uh, despite Eisenhower's reassurances, but then somebody decided this thing's got political legs and then it takes off. And so this is a this becomes a political hot potato. Eisenhower and the party are backed into a corner, uh, and then he decides to react. Right? He see from this defensive position, he designs an entire an entire architecture and strategy that's again has the foresight to produce outcomes that we still reap the benefits of today. 
Well, he, I, I'm not going to, well, I don't know whether to say he was a stubborn guy or not, but he was just not going to give in to hysteria. He was actually quite a passionate man himself. If you read his diaries, uh, he thought they were secret. I don't know um, how long he thought they were going to be secret, but uh, they, they certainly were um, until probably after his death. But um, he was a passionate man. You can read it in his words, especially his early diaries. But it, nevertheless, he was very uncomfortable with emotionalism, with hysteria. He thought no good uh, no good decisions come out of an atmosphere where everybody thinks the end of the world is coming. Um, some of the quotations from his opponents were just like crazy. Like uh, I think it was Mike Mansfield said that the um, you know the Soviet Union has lost or has won the Cold War. Wow, I mean just over um, you know uh, this small beeping device that was <laughs> going around Earth. In any case, the um, uh, I think the point I want to make sure we say on this segment is that actually the administration was quite delighted um, that the Soviet Union went first because the Soviet Union accidentally um, established the precedent for uh, free access to a low Earth orbit. Uh, and this was in contention because it was not clear whether sovereign airspace extended out into the cosmos. So. Um, the Eisenhower administration not only um, was taking all this pressure, but knew that for the long haul, the right thing had happened. Um, I think Ike, though, at the end of the day, was somewhat perplexed by um, America's expression of fear. And you know, I would say, Seth, that this, this feeling of vulnerability and fear has been with us ever since. Turned out we had a huge superiority in rockets and missiles and warheads and everything else, but Americans seem so vulnerable, and I really couldn't quite figure out why we were so fearful as a nation. What is your speculation? Well, um, actually, the thing that he couldn't um, quite put his finger on was the thing that became uh, very clear later. I mean, in some very cynical circles in Washington, I've got, I, I never use this term, but I've got friends who call it threat marketing. Um, and they believe that um, they can't make a case for their own worthy activity if it isn't framed in a national security way and that it, uh, um, and they can't make their own case unless their case comes with all kinds of dire predictions about what will happen if they don't get the funding. And um, I think that was part of what inspired Ike's uh, farewell address, um, the, especially the section about the military industrial complex, because by that time, uh, the missile gap debate, you know, had occurred. And it was very clear that, um, you know, the threat marketing, um, if you'll allow me to use that, even though I think it's, I don't like cynical words. I like to be optimistic too. Um, but that that works and it sells in America and it has political, it has political power. Did he ever express, the, the missile gap experience is one of the great tests of any individual's character if one is on the side of keeping the secret that there is no missile gap and we know that because of incredible intelligence collection that we can't reveal and then his opponents hammer him on this did he ever express bitterness in, in retrospect about how this played out well i don't know whether he felt a bitterness um I, I think that he thought that this was kind of uh, leadership and strategic immaturity um, because weren't we all trying to uh, do what's right for the country all the time? Uh, he had, um, he advanced what um, some people call the great equation, which was he believed that um, our financial and our economic strength was as um, big a pillar in our national security arsenal as were uh, our military capabilities. Um, and so if you uh, believe that uh, the state of the economy is as important as he did, uh, then you would be very worried about a lot of um, spending that's not necessary. As a matter of fact, probably many of our listeners today remember um, the wonderful, distinguished uh, General Andrew J. Goodpaster. He, stood, he told me he stood behind the president's desk and I could collaborate uh, this notion with a letter that Ike wrote to one of his friends. He said, God help this nation when a person sitting at this desk 
doesn't know as much about um, military budgeting and military spending as I do. He was just worried that this, this panic that had seemed to have overcome the United States would drive us to produce more than we needed um, and ultimately um, weaken our country because our economy would ultimately be affected. One of our audience members has asked, did the president ever talk of decisions that could have been different? I guess another oh, way. Oh, I, I think I think he had I think he had uh, legitimate um, regret about uh, the U two, the downing of the U two. Uh, it was his decision. His uh, associates in the White House really pressed him for one more U two flight over uh, the Soviet Union uh, just prior to the uh, Paris summit. Um, and that was um, planned just after this period. They, you know, uh, the enthusiasts in the administration thought having that little extra information would help in negotiations with Khrushchev. But again, you know, he had the opportunity uh, to assume plausible deniability, but he and I heard this as a kid too, he wanted to make sure that the Soviet Union understood that the president of the United States had control over the entire uh, national security apparatus, that he was president of the United States, that there wasn't any freelancing going on. Um, and, you know, I think that's a really um, important factor, but I, I do feel that he regretted that and that it set back US Soviet relations. Now, I would say this as somebody who spent a lot of time in that part of the world myself. I think he was uh, too optimistic perhaps that some kind of, uh, when I say optimistic, there, uh, I'm sorry, I wanna correct myself here. This is a very subtle point, Seth. He was optimistic, but he wasn't naive. But I think he felt that what kept him going was always believing that there was something he called a just and lasting peace. Um, and that would be um, some arrangement where, um, the United States and the Soviet Union uh, could work towards uh, human betterment, but uh, stay out of each other's uh, internal political affairs. Um, having understood that um, a hybrid of the containment uh, policy um, that he solidified at uh, the Solarium uh, project, understanding that there were red lines, but still, I, I think it's doubtful that um, that the U-2 would have changed much because the Soviet Union was given the opportunity to fly over fly the United States and they declined to do it. Um, so, you know, I don't think that that country was in any state of receptivity for such radical ideas. Another of our audience members is really getting to the getting to the Twitter, the Twitter version of the Twitter version of your book, which is what is the essential leadership lesson for today that emerges out of President Eisenhower's life? Well, oh, the Twitter version. I'm really glad they've added a few extra. Um, but you've got two, two. Yeah, you've got plenty of characters now. So. Oh, yeah. So I can actually get into one of these uh, follow the thread moments. Um, well, first of all, I think the thing that um, made his administration maybe perhaps different or certainly uh, notable is that his administration was organized in a way that was about as disciplined as he was. Uh, he was an extra, for all of his passionate nature, he was an extraordinarily disciplined person. Um, he kept a lot to himself. He blew off that steam um, through keeping a diary. He also used to write the names of um, people who drove him up the wall um, or um, uh, issues that um, got his blood pressure up and he'd uh, write it down on a piece of paper, crumple it up and throw it in the uh, bottom drawer of his desk uh, in the Oval Office. So poor Ann Whitman had to go in there and empty the drawer every evening. And I swear to God, she had to have a security clearance just to see who was on that paper. But anyway, discipline, I think is a hallmark of uh, Dwight Eisenhower's leadership because it takes a lot of discipline to be optimistic or project optimism, optimism even when you're not feeling that way inside. Uh, and he did it during his presidency. It might've had something to do with having a heart attack in 1955, uh, but he believed that that was the way you conduct business. So um, optimism, discipline, 
Um, and as I say, he had this knack. He was a, a long range thinker and he, um, not everybody understood it. Not everybody understood his own personal uh, leadership style, which was sometimes to work behind the scenes, sometimes to be out front, um, to use different tools in a strategist toolbox. Um, but ultimately, you know, he ran it his way. And I would say having been there um, when he uh, passed away, that he was a man at peace. And um, it's extraordinary when you think of what he saw in his life and what responsibility he had for life and death decisions, um, especially at a period of transition. So let me just say one final thing and uh, directly related to his leadership style is that I think he was um, exceptionally good at imagining things, which is why Lyndon Johnson once said that he was a genius at contingency planning and always would ask Johnson, you know, have you plugged all the holes? Do you know what contingencies uh, you need to um, uh, be aware of or uh, imagine for the future? So I think those are the things that make him different. Um, maybe you can't uh, put it into one Twitter thing. Uh, um, and maybe that's a good thing, because if you could, then we'd all be really worried about our futures. Uh, you know? um, it was a complex time in any transition, especially where big te uh, technological transformations are underway are especially complicated. How have, how have your students or, and young people reacted to the book? Well, um, uh, I'm, I'm getting some very interesting responses. Actually, um, one person told me that he never realized how important small gestures were. Um, so I have many examples in the book about small gestures uh, Eisenhower would do that came naturally to him, um, especially during the war. Um, you know, there were so many times he, he, before they put out an assassination uh, attempt on Eisenhower's life, that would be the Germans. Uh, I, uh, uh, from going from one place to another, would pick up GIs and give them a ride to where they were going. Uh, I mean, if it was, you know, uh, along the same roadway because he wanted to hear from them. So he sort of invented management by walking around. But um, there were so many small gestures that uh, I, I think will be better explained uh, in my book. Um, he was also a human being himself. You know, one of my very favorite parts of the book is that he carried some lucky coins with him. And during the war, his, uh, um, his valet would be sent back to the house they shared together if I didn't have his lucky coins with him and he had to uh, get on a plane and go somewhere else. These lucky coins were sent to him by ordinary Americans who wished him well. And one little girl who's nine years old uh, adopted him as her soldier and said that she prayed for him every night. And if he didn't have her lucky coin with him, <laughs> um, you know, uh, the trains would stop and the plane would wait an extra five minutes to uh, get the lucky coin pouch out and over there. So he was a, you know, he's a really, he was a human being. And, and, uh, but I think the people who worked for him understood that, that there was no pretense about him. He was, according to his 1915 uh, yearbook, as big as life is tw and twice as natural. And I think that was the big appeal he had for the American public. The, the human anecdote that really struck me was, um, there's the famous picture, of course, of him before D-Day talking to the paratroopers. He, he, of course, made the critical decision that they were essential to the invasion. So he, he, in a sense, was directly responsible for what he knew would be hundreds of problem deaths. Um, and he was going around asking them where they were from, and they would say where they were from. And of course, it appears that this is just a good commander putting someone at ease uh, before, you know, um, a good event and that of course is an important part of leadership but then it was explained that he was not just asking them where they were from to put them at ease but uh, to remind them of what they had to live for and in other words what they were fighting for so he always could connect the personal to the strategic even in the small gestures which i think is such a powerful uh example that you've illuminated in this book that really stays with me susan well, that's very nice to hear. Again, I have my father to thank for that. My father graduated from West Point on D-Day, coincidentally. 
Um, and I'm only smiling because I called him up um, one year and I said, uh, boy, this is a great day. This is June 6, 1944. And my father said, yes, it was. And I said, no, I mean that you graduated from West Point. And he said, <laughs> he said, oh, I think that's been forgotten long ago. So, um, but my father was um, one of Ike's intimates and had an unca uncanny way of describing how his father thought about things. And I was so lucky that we had him with us until 2013 and really had an opportunity to learn what he knew. But anyway, I just back to that point. Um, so um, Ike apparently not only liked to find out where they were from, but that very famous picture that you describe where he's looking very uh, determined. Uh, you think that these uh, poor paratroopers are getting um, the pep talk of their lives. And it turns out that Ike's finger like this is actually um, mimicking um, a fly fishing um, uh, opportunity. And, you know, this is, I'm not a fly fisherman, but I guess you've got to, you know, you've got to give it a good whirl and the camera just caught him then. So the tall paratrooper in that picture, and you'll see it, you know, many times everywhere, uh, number 23 lived, survived, uh, the war. And they did think that 50% of those paratroopers might be lost, which is a terrible number. And he said, oh yeah, we were talking about uh, fly fishing. And um, if you're an army officer and you've lived all over the United States of America, you've probably got a story or a connection with almost anybody. <laughs> well, Susan, that's a terrific um, example to end on. I wonder, do you have any other, any final thoughts? For, for us at CSIS, since we are, we're focused on strategy and international politics and much of what we talked about is leadership broadly applicable. Well, I guess I would just um, end by saying that um, my publisher wanted me to call the book How I Led the Decisions Behind Eisenhower's Greatest Decisions. And I said, oh, for heaven's sakes, you know, this is so, I, I'm just completely uncomfortable with it. And I said, it should be biggest decisions. And even uh, the ones in the book aren't necessarily all of them by any means. Um, but it's up to the reader to decide whether they um, agree with Dwight Eisenhower's decision making. Um, that was not my job. My job was to try, as I saw it, was to try and turn uh, this man who bore this extraordinary responsibility um, in both big war um, and peace during a transformational presidential um, eight years and to turn him into a human being. I wanted uh, people to step away and say, I think I know who he was. Not what he did, but who he was. And if I've been even remotely successful at that, um, then I'm happy. <laughs> well, I, I think you have succeeded beyond your publisher's wildest dreams and I'm glad you did not take their advice. <laughs> for, for me, th this book really is a mirror for our own shortcomings. We haven't talked about too many of them today, but I think if you read this book closely, you really have to reflect on both individually and as a nation where we are. On the other hand, it's a, it's, it's a supremely inspiring story. Uh, I hope for students and people who aren't as old as us who, who have a chance to fix all of these things. I mean, the, how Ike led was with Relentless optimism, which has been a theme of our conversation, decency. We haven't talked about his rigid adherence to honesty, his determination uh, to pursue every decision with modesty and never take credit. Uh, and it's a demonstration lesson that even in terrible times, those attributes actually are the ones that produce the best outcomes. Um, I, what struck me reading towards the end was when Andrew Goodpaster said, in cabinet meetings, the question that he asked most was what is good for America? And I think that's uh, a great question for all of us to ask today. So uh, Susan, it's been terrific. Everyone, Thank this is much. the book. Um, please take a look at it. Even one chapter is worth the insights. <laughs> this. So thanks, Susan, it's been terrific. Thank terrific. you, it's been a real pleasure. Mm -hmm.